Coming up, Felicity Huffman will spend 14 days in prison. The era of movie pass is coming to an end. We recap New York Fashion Week. And we discuss the insanity happening at the quarterback position in New York football. All that and more coming up on Unpeeled. Welcome back everyone to another episode of Unpeeled. I'm Chris Sachi. And I'm Megan Reynolds. Now, I don't know about you, Chris, but I am so excited to be back hosting our first episode <laughs> of the <Excited> semester. <laughs> is an understatement. I've been waiting for this for a long time. Let's get right into it. Top in the headlines this week, NBC Universal announced Peacock will be the name of their upcoming streaming service named in honor of NBC's longtime logo. The service is expected to launch in April and feature 15,000 hours of content. NBC will announce pricing for the service closer to the release date, but we do know that Peacock will include ad-supported and ad-free options. Coming on the heels of new streamers such as Disney Plus and Apple TV, the NBC slate is set to release exclusive content. Peacock will have Battlestar Galactica and Saved by the Bell reboots, as well as exclusive rights to The Office and Parks and Recreation. According to a press release, Peacock will, quote, tap into NBC Universal's unmatched ability to deliver a broad range of compelling topical content across news, sports, late night, and reality. Wow, that was a lot, but you know, mm -hmm. NBC is getting on the ball of give, launching their own streaming service, and they've got some great shows, you know, The Office, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Parks and Rec. These are big fan favorites that I'm sure fans will want to like buy the service to be able to watch mm -hmm. these shows. I mean, if you're a big fan of The Office, Parks and Rec, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, any of those shows, you pretty much have to go to Peacock. for That's your only chance of watching these shows, unless you're going to go onto some third-party site, kind of take the risk of running some uh, mm -hmm. some viruses on your computer. Exactly. If you can't, if you're not going to Peacock, there's no way to watch The Office, Netflix, Hulu. It's off of those. So exactly. it's a good way to lure people in, I think. Exactly. But there's also been some backlash from other companies. You know, Warner mm -hmm. Brothers tried to do this with Friends, and there was a huge outrage from Friends fans. And now Warner Brothers has let that stay on Netflix. So we'll see what you know and what storms NBC has to face. But you know, Peacock's name is coming from the classic logo, mm -hmm. but it's still an interesting choice, I think, it for is. a streaming service and a name. I like the name because everyone else, Apple Plus will get to, mm -hmm. Disney Plus, ESPN Plus, everything is just plus. Like, what's the originality? <laughs> Peacock is from the classic logo. It's something you can recognize through NBC. It's kind of like it's kind of brand. It's, it's colorful. You know, it's yeah. a colorful name, too. So I like the name Peacock. Maybe that's what will separate it between all these other streaming services. Exactly. Because Apple Plus, Disney Plus, it can kind of get lost in the shuffle, but this is a unique name. Exactly. But, I mean, despite that original brand, as you're talking about, you know, some critics are saying this is just the latest service to show the flaws of modern mm -hmm. streaming. You know, experts are now saying that there's this oversaturation in the market and fans are only going to subscribe to three, maybe four services max. So it's going to be a hard competition for these services, and I think we're going to see more original content. Yeah, yeah. And exactly. With, with so many of these services, like only three or four max, what people are going to sign up for, one of them, like I said, is going to get locked in the shuffle at least. Exactly. So, you know. But all right, in other NBC news, NBC fired comedian Shane Gillis from the 45th season of Saturday Night Live just days before the premiere date. A couple of days ago, racist comments Gillis made on his podcast and videos have resurfaced. Many of the comments were derogatory towards the Asian community. This comes just as SNL hired its first full-time Asian cast member, Bowen Yang. And the announcement comes just four days after SNL announced the full cast for the upcoming season. Now, according to an SNL spokesperson, executive producer Lorne Michaels said the show was unaware of his, quote, offensive, hurtful, and unacceptable language, end quote. Now, Gillis tweeted back saying that he, quote, feels like it's ridiculous for comedians to be making serious public statements End quote. He then said that he did respect SNL's decision. So, a lot to unpack here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you kind of have to go forward and fire Gillis for what he yeah, said. Yeah, especially in that today's podcast. political climate. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of companies have had to make moves like this, and there's just no tolerance for it anymore. And you know, now presidential candidate Andrew Yang will also be meeting with Gillis to talk about more sen him being more sensitive mm -hmm. in his, you know comedic routines. So yeah. I think that's a big step as well. And, they, and, and like I said, they kind of had to do it. Now, comedy is a tightrope. You know, mm -hmm. you want to be funny, but especially like you said, in today's political climate, it's a fine it's line hard. between offensive and just derogatory. Mm -hmm. And so. he obviously crossed the line 
with this. Now, he did go back on Twitter and kind of come back and said he did understand the decision. So I think it's good to him. Mm -hmm. It's something he said on Twitter. I mean, like he said, ridiculous to make public statements, but this is who we are. We're comedians, and this is what tends to happen when you kind of walk in that tightrope, exactly. like you said. And let's keep it in the entertainment <laughs> news world. Last week, Disney CEO Bob Iger is stepping away from his position on Apple's board of directors. This comes right after news of Apple dropping its, what do you know, a streaming service <laughs> within two weeks of Disney's very own streaming service. However, Iger had commented earlier this year about the possibility of stepping down from the board. In the statement, Iger says that it has been a privilege to work on the board and that he has the utmost respect for the Apple CEO. He went on to say that Apple is one of the most admired companies and that he is grateful to have served on their board. Wow, a lot to also unpack there. You know, all mm. these stories, hard hitting. But, you know, Apple and Disney, now they're competitors. They never were before. And so that's a conflict of interest for Iger. I think he made the right decision in stepping down. But, you know, their announcement of a streaming service, especially now, well, Dis new. Yeah. you know, Disney Plus just came out, mm. now Apple Plus. It's going to be a hard competition, I think. Yeah, I think the competition standpoint is another thing. Now, he will retire. Yes, he announced that's on true. September 10th. Very recently that he will retire in 2021. So maybe same this is just him. Apple. Yeah, the same day he did uh, retire, the same day as the launch of both of these streaming services. So mm -hmm. maybe maybe it's just a step back in his workload. He's 68 years old, so maybe he's just taking some time off. Exactly. So that could be a factor, but I think the competition between Apple Plus, Disney Plus is really kind of the main root of his mm -hmm. kind of just shifting his focus a little bit. You know, bit. his con, yeah, exactly. And his contract set to expire in 2021. It was supposed to expire in 2018. Again, mm -hmm. a few years before that, he kept extending it. But I think, you know, he's probably realized that this is his time and it's a new chapter. I don't think he's really willing oh, to be, be on right. board. Yeah. He'll be right in, okay. Mm -hmm. But in other news, last week, a Felicity Huffman received a 14 day prison sentence for her involvement in the recent college admissions fraud scandal. She will also pay a $30,000 fine and have to do two. 250 hours of community service. She is just the first of 15 wealthy parents to be charged in a scam that is be being called Varsity Blues. Now, Huffman is being sentenced for paying $15,000 to have her daughter's SAT scores artificially inflated. She had also pleaded guilty for one count of conspiring to commit mail fraud and a count of honest services fraud. So, some people might be saying, speaking of fraud, that it's fraudulent <laughs> that she gets only two weeks, a little bit of a slap on the wrist, exactly. considering my thing is, listen to the damage from other, other college students who maybe worked as hard as they could to get into these universities instead. Mm -hmm. Huffman's, you know, so one of their children gets a spot instead of this. Exactly, so. and there's also the flip side of this that are, people are saying that almost the sentence is a little um, biased and it's based on her privilege just because, mm -hmm. you know, there are people who have committed maybe similar, less offenses in terms of cheating and also, you know, nonviolent crimes, mostly to those drug offenses, and they received way harsher punishments for, you know, crimes that didn't maybe live up to it. but. And another question people are asking you, what does mm -hmm. this mean for Lori Laughlin? Yeah, I mean, beloved Ann Becky, you know, what's, <laughs> <laughs> she's a little more known, I think, than Felicity Huffman. So yeah. will her sentence be the same? Will she get a worse sentence because of that notoriety? Yeah. I think those are questions a lot of people want to know the answer to. And yeah, for Aunt Becky, that's the question. But coming up, let's move on a little bit. The business model thought to save theaters from the uprise of the streaming services we've been talking about, it's come to an end. Unpeeled Industry Reporter brings us through the rise and fall of movie pass next on Unpeeled. There's one thing you can never have sex without. It's not something you buy. Or something you take. In fact, there's only one way to get it. It has to be given to you, freely. It's consent. Because sex without it isn't sex. It's rape. Consent. If you don't get it, you don't get it. It's on us to stop sexual assault. Learn how and take the pledge at itsonus.org. Everybody has a dream. Mine was to see the ocean. And with a little help, Looking for these? You drive buzzed. It could be one very expensive ride. First, you gotta make bail. Then pay me to get your car back. Your insurance premiums will go through the roof. 
and my legal fees just keep adding up. All told, it could end up costing you $10,000. Buzzed, busted, and broke. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. Welcome back on Peelers. The movie theater subscription service, MoviePass, came to a halt this past week after efforts to create a sustainable business model failed. The popular service once boasted millions of subscribers, but was ultimately forced to shut down due to financial losses and technical issues. Unpeeled's industry reporter Liam Crowley joins us now to take us through the timeline of MoviePass. Thanks, Megan. The concept of MoviePass has always seemed a little too good to be true. And as it turns out, there was no catch for the subscriber, just a hefty financial loss for the provider. MoviePass officially closed its doors this past week. But how did we get here? Let's go back to where it all began. June 2011, MoviePass tests with audiences promising one movie in theaters per day for a monthly fee. Despite boasting 19,000 signups, theater chains refused to cooperate due to MoviePass's sketchy third-party system. October 2012, a national beta test launches with a starting price of $30 per month. Despite introducing a cleaner mobile app, major, major theater chains still refuse. December 2014, AMC partners with MoviePass after a subpar year in sales. Test phases launch in Boston and, De and Denver. June 2016, former Netflix and Redbox executive Mitch Lowe becomes MoviePass CEO, revamping its pricing tiers $50 per month for six movies, $99 for Unlimited. August 2017, MoviePass price drops to $10, yes, $10 a month for unlimited movies. MoviePass hits 400,000 subscribers, but only after losing their partnership with AMC. February 2018, MoviePass announces 2 million subscribers. Everything's got to be going great, right? Well, in April 2018, analytics show that the company is losing $20 million each month. This forces MoviePass to limit subscribers to only three movies monthly. June 2018, competition arrives. AMC announces AMC Stubbs A-List, where for $20 per month, customers can see three movies per week at their select theaters. August 2018, website crashes, price increases, and subscriber outcry, oh my. Subscribers who attempt to cancel their subscriptions are automatically re-enrolled. Couple that with a new limited movie option format, and you've got a recipe for disaster. January 2019, new year, new movie pass, right? The company announces new tiers riddled with restrictions, including upcharges for IMAX, 3D, and movies deemed just too popular for the cheap monthly fee. July 2019, MoviePass goes on an unannounced sabbatical, promising to return even stronger. Well, in August 2019, tens of thousands of MoviePass customer credit card numbers are exposed to the public. How could this happen? Because the company forgot to password protect their server. And on September 13th, 2019, after years of enraged customers and embarrassing financial reports, financial reports show that MoviePass is scheduled to close its doors for good. Now, how this service survived nearly a decade is beside me. Regardless, companies can learn a lot from MoviePass. Make realistic promises, be financially responsible, and set your passwords. Rest in peace, MoviePass. Gone, but never forgotten. Guys, back to you. <laughs> Great job, Liam Crowley. Papers flying everywhere with the dates. Absolutely love to see it. Killed it as always now. Despite the edit movie pass, people are still making their way to the theater. Jennifer Lopez is making headlines after her new film, Hustlers, stunned box office critics with a $33 million domestic opening weekend. The film, in which Lopez served as both an actor and producer, marks the biggest live action opening of her career, leading some critics to be saying that Oscar buzz might be on the way. Unpeeled's film reporter Andrew Goldberg is here now with the latest on J-Lo's most recent discuss. Oscar buzz, J-Lo. Andrew, oh yeah. thanks so much for coming on. <laughs> Absolutely. So what really stood out for me in this film was its cast as the driving force. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got a solid mix of both veterans and young stars. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, you have Jennifer Lopez, Julia Stiles, really established actors who have kind of had up and down film careers, but here delivering some of their best performances in years. And then on the other hand, you have uh, Constance Wu and Kiki Palmer, uh, a couple young stars who are really starting to make names for themselves. And I think the diversity of this cast really helps with the realism uh, in the sense that uh, you're showing uh, the people who are actually involved in the incident. And that's important because the movie Hustlers was based on real events. That's awesome. So, you know, a lot of people were actually expecting this movie to flop, but why was Hustlers' success so surprising? I mean, I saw the trailer mm -hmm. and I personally loved it. And I knew it would do great. So what were, you know, critics maybe thinking it would flop for? Well, it's an interesting question. Of course, hindsight's twenty twenty, <laughs> But I think uh, there are a couple of things to look into here. First, the movie's budget. I mean, even for a drama film, $20 million, while it sounds like a lot, is really not that much to go off of. 
Um, so a lot of people were kind of expecting this to be kind of a B movie, might do well on some film festivals, but wouldn't really draw mainstream appeal. But obviously Boy, now, they were wrong. Yeah, yeah people, <laughs> people once they got word of its success, definitely wanted to see it. And of course, the other factor to look into here is Lopez as a producer. Mm -hmm. While she's been a star for a number of years, she hasn't really had that much success as a producer developing her own movies. But now teaming up with Will Ferrell and Adam McKay, that's starting to change, and I think people are starting to take notice. Yeah. Exactly. So go going on J Lo, do you see her after you know this route as a producer? Is she going to become big time? Is it is her is her her time now to kind of become a big time producer? Well, it's a little early to say that, and I think you have to look at her career as a whole because she's got music, she does business, fashion, so she has a lot going on mm -hmm. in her life. But at the same time, if you're a young, up-and-coming actor, you might look at Hustlers and say, man, I want a piece of that. I want to <laughs> yeah. work alongside Jennifer Lopez. I mean, I would if I was a young actor. Yeah. So I think she's going to start to get a lot of calls coming her way for uh, future movie roles. Exactly. You know, there was, you mentioned earlier that there was maybe some Oscar hype. Are you buying into that? Do you think that... It has an actual shot, or is this all just the hype of Big the success? Here. Well, yeah. I think it's a little early for Oscar buzz, mm -hmm. but once, uh, once award season starts to come around, I think you have to look at the award shows and uh, the sewer review circuit, because if they start getting Golden Globe nominations, maybe some mm -hmm. Toronto Film Festival There's uh, the buzz. hype, yeah. that's going to start getting the ball rolling. So once award season rolls around, I think you're going to start to get some people on the hype train, and I might be included in that. All right, well, thank you for that, Andrew. But coming up, a photographer sues supermodel Gigi Hadid over posting a picture of herself. Find out why it may be illegal to post your own photo to Instagram after the break. You don't want to miss this. Taking care of a family member can lead to plenty of questions. Fortunately, there's a place to get the answers for them and for you. Find articles, tips, and tools from experts and others who have been in your place. The Caregiving Resource Center at aarp.org slash caregiving. <laughs> Welcome back in on Peelers. Model Gigi Hadid faces a lawsuit over photos she posted on Instagram with ex-boyfriend Zayn Malik. Earlier this week, entertainment photog uh, photographer Robert O'Neill filed a lawsuit with Hadid for copyright infringement. He claims he owned and registered the photo, and Hadid has no right to reproduce or distribute it. On Peelers pop culture reporter Katie Lane is with us now for the latest on Hadid's legal situation. Kenny, thanks so much for coming down. This is pretty crazy. You can't post your own photo. Why is he suing her? What's, what's going on? All right, so like you said, he so Hadid took advantage of his exclusive right to reproduce this photo and distribute it as he wants. So she did took it into her own hands and put it on her Instagram story um, without his permission. Mm -hmm. She didn't pay him or anything like that. So again, took his work and put it on her own personal account. Um, so. Honestly, I think she probably could have afforded this if she did want to pay him. <laughs> but these, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this actually isn't the first time that this has happened to Hadid. This is the third time. Oh, wow. She's, she's done this so two she, other times. She should have known better, maybe. <laughs> I know, I know. In 2017, she posted a photo of herself. Um, it belonged to Peter Sapita. And then again in January of 2019, she was sued for posting a photo of herself to her Instagram account. Um, but th what was interesting with this is she went back and forth with exclusively a photography company. Um, but the case was dismissed in July because the company apparently never received a copyright registration for the photo uh, prior to filing the lawsuit. So, so yeah. Hadid posted this photo months ago, if I'm understanding this correctly. So what was the catalyst, you know, that's causing this lawsuit now because I think a lot of people are a little confused about that. You know, you posted months ago and now it's coming up. You know, what was the deal with that? Yeah, <laughs> I know. I was thinking the exact same thing. Nobody really knows exactly why. Um, but what I think is funny is she posted it to her Instagram story. So okay. for 24 hours on her Instagram story. It's not um, a huge deal. And I mean. yeah. back in June. So why now? I'm not quite sure. But 
so she's not even dating Zayn anymore at this <laughs> point. So now it's just bringing all that back. She's yeah. dating um, Tyler Cameron uh, from The Bachelorette, the Bachelorette as yes. of right now. Fan well, favorite. Casually dating, <laughs> yes. So, but yeah, O'Neal just filed this against her on Friday, three months after she posted it on Instagram story for 24 hours. Interesting. Well, hopefully we'll have some more updates with that coming in the future. But for now, the annual New York Fashion Week wrapped up this weekend with some of fashion's hottest models hitting the runway to show off their respective brands. Miley Cyrus, Ansel Elgore, and a number of other celebrities dropped by to see the latest styles, including headliners Tom Ford and Gucci. Unpeeled's lifestyle reporter Olivia Tomino joins us now to walk us through the runway. Olivia, thank you so much for being here thank tonight. Thank you for having We're me. We're so glad to have you back this season so first what were some of the highlights from the week that's definitely a tough question with everything that happened <laughs> at New York Fashion Week but one of my favorites was Tom Ford's show because he actually packed a bunch of celebrities into a subway station in the city so you had people like Miley Cyrus there you had Angela Elgort there so it's just like a really fun environment I think and his clothing line that he showed actually really mirrored that location because it was a bunch of streetwear um, darker colors with some pop so it was really fun um, and then you had, obviously, amazing models like Gigi Hadid walking the show mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, that was just going to be amazing. Um, another one of my favorite highlights was Tess Holliday walking in the Chromat show. So, Chromat is still kind of up and coming, mm -hmm. and they actually have been really focusing on being inclusive lately. So, they had her walking in a white dress that said sample size on it. So, I thought that was just a really fun message. And they were also going with having their clothes being sustainable. So, you had clothes from upcycled material. So, they had a great message. So, those would be my two favorites. Something more bigger name, and then, you know, Chromat up and coming. That's, that's very nice. Some of the mm -hmm. inclusivity and sustainability. Great to exactly. see. I remember yeah. now, before we talked about a Zendaya and Tommy Hilfiger collab at Paris Fashion Week that was earlier this year. Mm -hmm. Now, I saw that they also worked together at New York Fashion Week. What's what's going on with them? That's a pretty interesting yes. collab we got going yes. on. Yes, two powerhouses definitely together, yes. especially with Zendaya lately. So they came back and made another collection together. And this year, it was a 70s theme. So that was kind of building um. off of the disco at Paris Fashion Week. So they definitely have something going there. And it was at the Apollo Theater. Um, you just They were hardcore on the 70s. Velvet suits. They had a live string band. And it was just a lot of fun. Um, afterwards, Zendaya said that she wants everyone to leave with a smile on her face. And I definitely think they did that. So I mean, it's Zendaya. How can you not smile? Exactly. But <laughs> we know that some designers, you know, they like to be a little bit out there with their, with their shows, mm -hmm. you know. So what was some of the craziest shows that, in your opinion, for this week? So something that wasn't actually a design but Cheetos, yes, the mm. snack, had their okay. own fashion show at Fashion Week. <laughs> Very so nice. I don't know why. I guess maybe they were trying to capitalize on the orange trend that we've been seeing. And they had a bunch of different styles that they kind of made from online on social media. And they came up with their own clothing line, which unfortunately it's not mm. going to be for sale. But they had a pop-up shop in the city afterwards where you could buy um, different Cheetos things and get a cheeto fied makeover. So yeah, that was uh, kind of interesting. <laughs> I would have loved to have been able to buy maybe a Cheetos shirt, some of the stuff they were doing. But yep. overall, we'll take it away. <laughs> Still love to see Cheetos in New York Fashion Week. <laughs> Olivia, thank you so much. Now to the world of sports. Coming up, the New York Jets and the New York Giants <laughs> both face a lineup change. Find out what happened to each of the team's quarterbacks next on Unpeeled. told me a bottle couldn't dream. That I would never become a superhero. But I learned how to fly. Just to come back in a new disguise. And be the hero that I've always wanted to be. When I was in foster care, I never knew when I would have to move, so I always had my suitcase ready to go. Then one day, I was adopted. My new parents opened their hearts and home to me. My parents cook my favorite breakfast for me every morning. My parents take me on trips I never thought I would go on. They gave me a home and an even better reason to use that suitcase. My parents aren't perfect, but they're perfect for me.
After a crushing one-week loss to the rival Buffalo Bills, the New York Jets this week received even worse news. Starting quarterback Sam Darnold will be out for at least three weeks after contra contracting the bacterial disease mononucleosis. The diagnosis is a major blow to Darnold and the Jets, who are hoping to earn a playoff appearance for the first time since 2010. Unpeeled sports reporter Mason Horodisky is here to tell us how the Jets plan on surviving life without Darnold. All right, Mason, you got to give us a scoop. What exactly happened? Well, I mean, where do you even begin with this team? This team is in an absolute dumpster fire situation <laughs> what right else now. Is new? Oh, yeah, what else is new? It's the New York Jets. Last week, or not last week, last Monday, they ended up getting stomped by the Cleveland Browns 23-3 to mm -hmm. on their home turf at MetLife Stadium, pretty much because of the fact that Sam Darnold has been out. Trevor Simeon had to come in. Mm -hmm. He wasn't even expected to even touch the field, let alone start a game this year. And lo and behold, he gets hurt in that game, and they have to bring in a third-string quarterback. Saji, I'm sure you were pretty yeah. high on him as well. Third stringer, Luke Falk, my favorite guy off the practice squad, did not play play last year, but actually did all right. I mean, this was supposed to be a breakout year for Darnold, and it's already derailed after one week. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, you know what? How the Jets have responded? I mean, this is a tough situation. Their backup gets hurt. Now onto the third stringer. How'd they respond? Well, obviously, they didn't respond well. They got stomped <laughs> out by the Browns 23-3, to but mm -hmm. this just seems like the most Jets thing possible that could have happened to the Jets. Like, think yeah. about this. Your quarterback, who came in with all this hype last year, who was supposed to have his breakout year this year, gets diagnosed with mono. <laughs> how does he even get mono? I don't even want to think about how he gets mono, because I don't want to know the real answer behind that. Look, there's the... <laughs> I don't the, think anyone wants no, to know the answer There's the butt one. fumble, <laughs> there's not going to the Super Bowl since 1970, and now there's monogate. I hate this. Yeah, well, as a Jets fan, trust me, I can tell you all about that. But let's go to it's the other team in New York. The New York Giants also have a new quarterback this week. Head coach Pat Shermer has made the choice to rookie Daniel Jones, sixth draft pick this year in the draft, over longtime legend Eli Manning. Mason, tell us about this situation. Well, I mean, the Giants have finally wised up to what this season should have been from the get-go, a rebuild. Look, mm -hmm. whenever you trade a once-in-a-generation style wide receiver like Odell Beckham away for just picks and a random uh, D back that not D yeah D back that we won't even talk about. Yeah. Uh, oh. <clears throat> It, that should be a tell, tell point that this season is going to be a rebuild. Instead, they waste a quarterback pick on the, with the number six overall pick getting Daniel Jones, and they still start a 38-year-old Eli Manning. He is washed. This team has no business putting a guy that old to start the season if you want to consider mm -hmm. the season to be a rebuild. Long story short, you can't win a rebuild with a guy who's almost 40 years old. It and makes no sense. I mean, I think a lot of uh, Giants fans have been feeling that way for years, but, you know, compare... Um, so where do the Giants go from here with Jones? You know, tell me about that. You know, I think a lot of fans are wondering and speculating. So where do you see this going for the season? Well, I mean, a lot of scouts have said that he's like the next Eli Manning, but I don't know he if that's... He looks a lot like him. He does? Too. No, I look at the pictures online. He's very... I mean, he's got a real hair. stupid face like Eli, yeah. trust <laughs> me. He's got a real big Eli face, but I mean, I don't know if being the next Eli Manning is a good or a bad hey, thing. It's just a lot two of pressure. Super Bowl rings. Hey, I'll t I mean, hey, granted, he's got two Super Bowl rings, but he's the biggest question mark out of a quarterback class that's already had a bunch of question marks. Mm -hmm. Kyler mm -hmm. Murray's been less than stellar for the Arizona Cardinals. Dwayne Haskins hasn't even seen the field yet. So, I mean, I guess he's got a good test against Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay is good, not great, so we'll see what happens there. But we're just going to have to wait and see if he really is the next Eli Manning. All right, so real quick, who has it worse? The Jets with their third stringer or the Giants moving on from a legend in Eli to kind of a rookie QB in Daniel Jones? Oh, without a question, the Jets have it much worse because at the end of the day, the Jets had hope. It didn't even matter. Thanks you so much. Oh, of course. Don't worry. I'm going to wrap you up. I'm sorry. I'll <laughs> talk sports all day. No, of course. That's all the time we have. So thanks for joining us this week on un this week's episode of Unpeeled. I'm Megan Reynolds. And I'm Chris Sachi. Tune in next week for uh, 71st Emmy Awards. Have a great night, Unpeeled. <laughs>